the AR-15 dissected from muzzle to buttstock. That's what we're going to talk about this series, this mini-series, like the Lonesome Dove on ARs on Gunfighter Life. I'm going to cut this down, break it down into smaller parts. There's a lot to America's Rifle. There's so much variety. It can kind of be overwhelming. You can definitely get analysis by paralysis looking at ARs and different features. And do I need this? And is free float really important to me? And and what is a muzzle break anyway? Is it really going to make a difference? All that stuff. This is a series again. So hopefully you're like, subscribe, following already. But if not, make sure you are. That way you get all of these. Welcome. To Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns and gun fighting the right way with Almighty God at the center, Judeo Christian values, and real world first hand experience. I am blessed to be your host. First and foremost, I am a Christian. I make no apologies for that. God has blessed me to be a professional gunfighter most of my adult life in many different ways. I won't put in the normal bio today, I'll stick to what's germane to the AR 15. Because that's going to play into today's episode. Marine Corps combat veteran joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours. Was also an urban warfare instructor under Mojave Viper. Also served in the U.S. Army with full-time and part-time National Guard. West is in both were infantry. So a grunt. You might do some familiarity with the M16 slash AR-15 platform there. Also served... As a sworn peace officer, a COP, the common vernacular, LAPD, worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments, worked with some three-letter government agencies on on some of those assignments. Also been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency that I won't specify. Also was blessed to be the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area here, CONUS, in the United States. So... You might imagine from that, I've been blessed to have a lot of experience with the AR-15 platform. And I'm going to try and be as diplomatic with this as I can while being honest. Let's get into part two. On this high-velocity 22 caliber rifle here, the AR-15, let's talk about gas blocks. We left off last time, muzzle, device, and barrel. That's all the further we made it in part one. Part two, gas blocks. Now, the standard is going to be your kind of mil spec. Now, the kind of standard is, I think, the F mark or the F sized front sight post. Rugged, rock solid. If you want the absolute, in my opinion, beefiest, not going to break, not going to bend, not going to go out of sight alignment. The kind of military de facto front sight base and gas block. Why is this important? Well, I don't really want to get into explaining exactly how the AR-15 operates. Hopefully you know that. But there is a hole drilled in the top of the barrel. Whether you're talking about a piston system or a direct impingement, I know it's not technically a direct impingement, it's a gas piston, but commonly referred to as DI. Either way, there's going to be a hole drilled in the top of the barrel that lets gas out. That has to get channeled generally through a gas block. The kind of classic military front sight is not just a front sight. It's integrated in there, but it is... Think of it like a bracket that goes around the barrel to capture that gas and funnel it into a gas tube. Again, if you're talking about a DI system. To funnel that energy, that gas pressure, where you want it. That's what it does. And that's a very important function, right? The rifle cannot function without it, so don't overlook this. That kind of integrated front sight, military-looking, oftentimes sling, swivel, and bayonet lug attached all to that one apparatus. There's a lot going on there. But most importantly, it captures that gas and puts it going in the right direction where you want it. There are some, 
odd proprietary exceptions, but most of these are going to pretty much be the same size, you know, internal diameter to fit on most barrels and whatever the barrel contour is. And again, there are exceptions. You can get your own proprietary stuff. But in general, the vast majority are going to be a similar size. So even if you have like a pencil profile barrel or a government profile barrel, you see them either taper up or taper down where the gas port is. I think technically a different piece, but often right touching against it is that bracket to hold on the front part of your handguard. Now that's the old classic military style. You can free float a barrel with this old school type of front sight. It would require, in most cases, taking it off and putting it back on again, but it can be done. But what has kind of been in vogue for quite a while now is the low profile gas block. The big advantage of these is you can put on hand guards, free float hand guards, on and off. You can take them on and off without having to take off the gas block. Now, really, really important, I think, and often overlooked, and I learned this the hard way, how it attaches is really important. I think the military specification of actually drilling into the barrel and putting a pin in that piece of metal so that it can't work loose is really important for a fighting rifle. For a competition rifle or a hunting rifle, not that big a deal. But for a fighting rifle, absolutely. If it's just screwed on with some set screws or something like that, it can work loose. Ask me how I know. That's a bad time. If you are going to not have it pinned through and you are going to have screws, just hopefully countersink those have something going into the barrel countersink them something so that that front sight base and the gas block is not going to work loose because obviously that has to align with the hole in the barrel if not that gas is not going to get where it needs to go and you're basically going to have a single shot at best maybe a malfunction every pull of the trigger at worst but how it attaches is really, really important. It might be easy to just put one on that just takes set screws without any flat spot or altercation or anything on the barrel. But again, on a fighting rifle, I would want something more robust than that. There are adjustable gas blocks, especially if you're going to run um, suppressed. A lot of people like those. But your two big ones are today are the old school military front sight post with all that stuff integrated or a low profile gas block that your free float tube is going to fit over. And again, those are your two main ones. I guess attaching into that, so we'll cover it, is your gas tube. Now, with gas tubes, you get into gas system length. The traditional one for the M16, the rifle length, talking about the M1, the M2, or Sorry, the M16A1, the A2, the A4, they all, I believe, share a the same gas, gas system length, rifle length. <clears throat> the other big one for at least military stuff is carbine length. And I talked about this in the stuff that maybe is not germane to you in a different episode, but that is mainly so you can, unless I'm missing something, so you can attach a bayonet to the M4, to that 14 5-inch barrel, and still have everything work as it should. You get more gas port erosion with the carbine length. You get more heat pressure, things like that. Other things being equal. I'm not a big fan of the carbine length, but it is kind of the de facto for... Carbine length is kind of the default for 16-inch, 14 5-inch, or smaller barrels. You'll often see on the civilian side, which I think is better than the military spec, the mid-length gas system. You can get a rifle length gas system on a 16-inch barrel, but it's not common. The dissipator from Delton, maybe some other people messed with it, but not really common. But what is fairly common is the mid-length gas system. If you're looking for a gun, you're going to shoot a lot, want a little bit smoother operation. All of the things being equal, in my opinion, I would go with a mid-length gas system if you're talking about a 16-inch or shorter over a carbine length, if if you can get it. A lot of times you're going to get stuck with a carbine length. If you go really, really short, I think there's even a pistol length, but you're talking about really short. In general, if you're talking about, you know, 11.5, 12.5, which is as short as I like to go in an AR, you're talking carbine length. That's your gas system. Your gas tubes, I mean, get a good one. A gas tube is not something you want to mess up, and 
if you're shooting a lot a lot of rounds really quickly a lot of times the gas tube can be what fails get a good quality gas tube if you're getting a mainstream manufacturer the gas tube is probably fine and that's going to run back to what's commonly referred to as your snorkel or your gas key on your bolt but we'll get to there when we get there let's go back forward the hand guard probably what people fuss about way more than the gas block even though it probably should be the reverse the hand guard i guess let's talk about real quick development and there's probably some sub variants that i'm not really going to touch on but the big ones you had your m16a1 the big triangle vietnam style hand guards the main purpose of the handguard is so you don't burn your hand when touching a hot barrel, right? And give you a more ergonomic place to grip. On the better ergonomics, I think they wanted something thinner. So they went to the M16A2 style. These are just the round, ribbed, really minimalist handguards. You'll see these on the M16A2. And you'll get even shorter ones for like the carbine length variants of the same era. Then... Not exactly sure when, but I started seeing them like in the GWAT. You get your quad rail, like your Knight's Armament quad rail or other quad rails. And this was this was big for a while. They're still fairly common because they're so... Anytime the military adopts something, they become super common. These allow you to add force multipliers, white lights, PEC IR lasers... Sling attachment points, all kinds of different things in different places. And that's the quad rail. You have four Picatinny rails, 19, 13 rails at 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. Right? Just a straight rail that goes pretty much the most of the length of the handguard. Those are good. They, they're a lot better if you're trying to mount extra stuff than just the regular handguards. M16A4 will have a like a rifle length version of this. Is what I carried my second tour in Iraq. The first tour was just an old minimalist A2. The second tour was an A4. I guess we'll get the uppers at a different point. But the quad rail, kind of a standard. They're also a bit heavy and they're also a bit less than ergonomically ideal. A lot of times you'll put like rail covers on there. A lot of times you'll see that like with the big rail covers or the minimalist rail covers so you don't cheese grate your hand. But that was the quad rail. You'll still see those around. If you just want to mount something and you get a good deal on one, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just not very ergonomic. And then was the great debate of key mod versus M-Lock. I don't really care. I actually, well, my go-to AR is even predates that. It has a Samson rail. But I think M-Lock kind of won that race. All these are just ways to have more modularity without the extra bulk of the quad rail. So a lot of these will be thinner, lighter for a given length than your quad rail. And they're more modular because you get more than just four different positions. You get generally like a lot more varying positions that you can mount stuff. I think the vast majority of those have way too much stuff on there. But it doesn't really hurt anything. And you remove material instead of adding the quad rail. You're kind of removing material and then you add on where you want the accessory. So it's a better system than the quad rail. I think just a straight thin tube with a few places on the front for mounting accessories. But you'll often see that, you know, again, m kind of won that race. But literally just a way to mount things on your forend your float tube something i think that can be important but i think is often really overemphasized is free floating now free floating is important for a couple of reasons if you want really good accuracy uh, free floating will let that barrel kind of vibrate inside the tube pretty well without interfering with anything if it's done right which should lead to greater accuracy all of the things being equal you can have a really inaccurate free floated gun and you could have a really accurate most of the time, not free-floated gun. Again, accuracy in an AR, there's a lot that plays into that that has to kind of synchronize and play the symphony of accuracy for that gun. But in general, free-floating is a little bit better for just straight accuracy. Whether that matters for combat accuracy is, is kind of debatable. Another big benefit is if you're shoving the forearm into something, like you're shoving it down on something or you're sh- leaning against a wall or squeezing on it if you have a sling and you're pulling down on the sling if it's not free floated you can manipulate your point of impact 
meaning you're not going to hit where you're going to shoot. Now, depending on distance and the shot parameters, that may or may not make any difference at all. But it very well may. If you free float that handguard, you should be able to crank down. Let's say your sling is not attached to your barrel anymore, but attached to your attached to your handguard. You should be able to crank down on that handguard really hard. It should not touch the barrel at all. So you're not manipulating your point of aim, point of impact. If you're resting the rifle, and you're not resting it on the barrel, and you're just resting it on the handguard, again, it should not interfere with point of aim, point of impact. Now, the older, you know, M16A1, A2s, the just a regular kind of plastic with the aluminum inside handguards, two-piece handguards, those are not going to be free-floated, but they can still be very accurate. Especially if you know how the tension on that forearm is going to affect your point of aim, point of impact. But in general, free floating is better. That's why you see a lot of free floated stuff today. You see a big move in that market. So that's free floated versus non free floated. A really good one if you want a good minimalist upgrade to just a kind of more standard military style is the Magpul. And I get no sponsors or kickbacks or anything, but the Magpul. They're very basic handguards that you can literally just mount if it's got the old two-piece handguards. They're pretty ergonomic. They still let you mount, you know, force multipliers, a white light, probably most common for most people. And those are really good. And they're not expensive, and they're pretty ergonomic, and again, they work pretty well. But that's kind of your handguard, and there's all kinds. You can go ultra light weight. You can go aluminum. You can go carbon fiber. You can get crazy on the handguards, but a lot of that, honestly, I think is aesthetics. Uh, but also important is weight. You can get a lot of lightweight handguards. Obviously, the handguards attached at the back, if you're talking about the more traditional, is going to be like a spring cup that you push down. Sounds easy, but sometimes it can be a real pain in the butt to get the old school handguards on and off. Underneath that, there's going to be a nut. There's, I'm sure, proprietary nuts and things. This is a part where I'd say if you're building an AR... Have somebody else do it. If you're having, you can build a lot of stuff on the AR yourself, but if you're buying stuff, I would, if unless you really have the tools and know what you're doing, I would say do not buy the barrel and attach it to your upper receiver. Have that done by a professional. That's like one of the key points where I would really want somebody that knew what they were doing to attach those two things. Buy like a stripped upper with the barrel and the upper receiver already attached. It's not that big a deal. Or if you want something special like a upper without a forward assist, which I'm all for, then have somebody that knows what they're doing with the right tools to the right specifications, not just guessing how much tension is on there, doing that properly. But that kind of nut linkage where the barrel meets the upper receiver and the hand guard attached, all that stuff, that is an important area. So treat it with the respect that it's due. Alright, I think that's a good stopping point before we get into other parts of the gun. We've pretty much got back to the linkage of where the barrel meets the receiver. I think that's a good place. It's going to be a shorter version of this, going to be a shorter installment of this mini-series. The Lonesome Dove of ARs here. I am not. I don't remember exactly how many parts were in Lonesome Dove, but it's a good, good western, but a drug on. But you probably don't care about me talking about Lonesome Dove. So let us... Start wrapping this up. If you are a good gunfighter, hopefully you're dry firing. Hopefully you have a pretty legit routine. That's important. Dry fire is important. Military, police, special assignments, all kinds of stuff that I've done. Dry fire. Dry fire is important. That automaticity, that commonly referred to as muscle memory. Your muscles don't have memory, but you get the idea. That is important. Dry fire is important. One thing, and I have no affiliation. I I just somebody mentioned these and I got them. But dry fire training cards. It's got a real thing on there. I think it's dryfiretrainingcards.com. Dry fire training cards. I was just dry firing in between part one and part two of recording this. My daily dry fire routine. God willing, except for Sabbath, every day I will dry fire. Very few exceptions. Like when I was on the Alaska ferry, obviously. Can't dry fire there. Maybe even next time if I get a really big tent, I can do some dry firing. But but 
unless there's a really good reason, not an excuse, try and dry fire every day but Sabbath. On Sabbath, you rest. But dry fire training cards, dryfiretrainingcards.com, I'm not affiliated with them at all. They may or may not know this podcast even exists. In general, I have a pretty normal routine with the basics. I just did a whole episode on armed citizen training if you want like a DIY live fire training thing. But I have some go-to things that I do in dry fire, but sometimes it can get tedious at nauseum. These dry fire training cards are a good way to spice stuff up that I may not think of otherwise. Just stuff that I don't normally practice. So the dry fire training cards. If you're serious about dry fire, you've been doing it a while. For the beginner, I'd say focus on the fundamentals. But if you've been doing it a while and it's getting a little dry, haha, right? Maybe check out the dry fire training cards. Anyway, with that, before we get into the last and hopefully best part of the episode, this is a series... Again, so if you're not like, subscribe, following the show, you might want to think about scrolling down and doing that. A review is appreciated, but at least like, subscribe, follow the show. Also, if you appreciate this content, if this pointed you in the right direction on any part of an AR that you're looking at, if you think that is worth a dollar, because what is that AR part? Not even an AR. What's the AR part going to cost you there, gunfighter? Think about supporting the podcast that helped you with the knowledge. Consider supporting the show. It would be a blessing to me. If you want to bless me that way, I would appreciate it. If not, listen for free and don't feel guilty. It's not a guilt trip. But if you want to support this show, I would greatly appreciate it. You can scroll down. There should be a Patreon link in the show notes. If you just want to throw a couple of bucks, there's a Venmo link as well. If you just want to throw a couple of dollars and not sign up for anything and not want any extra content, then a Venmo link is also on there. With that, Your tactical verse of the day. Because if you win all the gunfights and die and go to hell, you know, you lost. Here is your verse today, men. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them. Because they take refuge in him. God is our refuge and our strength, men. The guns, the swords, they're just a tool. Hopefully you're fighting for the right reasons at the right time. And fighting with God and not contrary to God. With that, thanks for listening. And have a blessed day.